You're listening to The Peach Pit. I'm here with James Corbett of The Corbett Report. James, thank you for t- so much for taking time to talk to me, and welcome to The Pit. Well, thank you for having me on. It's a pleasure to be here. So, how are things in Japan? Things are weird, but I suppose no more weird and perhaps significantly less weird than they are in Canada and elsewhere. Uh, the madness that's sweeping around the globe is certainly here in Japan as well, but maybe not to the same extent that it is in other countries where people are basically being discouraged from so much as leaving their house. Well, that is not happening here in Japan. Uh, Life is going on relatively as usual, although, of course, that is a relative uh, uh, factor. But as I say, things are not quite as strange here as I know they are in some parts of the globe right now. And you are a Canadian who's found his way to Japan, and you've come back to Canada, I'm assuming, a couple of times since then. When you come back to Canada and go back to Japan, what do you miss the most about Canada? Excellent question. Uh, At first, it was mostly everything, but over time, as I've lived in Japan for 16 years now, I find I am more and more Japanese. That used to be kind of a joke, but now it's actually somewhat true. Uh, So I miss less and less. Obviously, I miss my family, I miss my friends, and I occasionally miss some of the food. But other than that, (laughs) I don't, I gotta say, I miss the Rocky Mountains. I grew up in Calgary, so I do miss the Rockies. Uh, The mountains here in Japan just don't cut it. So I think the people who follow alternative media would already be familiar with you, but uh, I need to get to know just how that all began for you. How do you remember getting interested in alternative media? Well, specifically in 2006, I was here in Japan, and I, uh, I had a very mundane, everyday event in my life. I moved into a new apartment here in Japan, and unlike all the previous apartments I'd been living in, this one came with an internet connection, so suddenly I was online and connected in a way that I hadn't been since I left Canada in 2000. Well, 2004, actually, really more like 2002, because that's when I went to uh, Ireland to study for a year. So I had not had a connection, internet always on, 24-7 internet connection, for a few years at that point. And I found in the time between when I last had a connection in 2006, all these new services and ideas were coming up, like YouTube and, at the time, things like Google Video and what have you. And it just provided me with such incredible access to pretty much whatever I wanted at any given time. And me being a political person, I was interested in political content online, and it wasn't long before I started finding all this content of verifiable information, facts about the world that I had never been taught before. I had never seen this on the news. It had never been reported to me. My teachers had never told me in school. Why is that? So I went down the rabbit hole as the the old proverbial saying goes, and I ended up pretty quickly, within a year, starting the website, and I've been doing it for 13 years now. I never in a million years would have imagined I ever even would have started a website, let alone that I would be doing it full time. 13 years, that's quite an accomplishment, and a big part of uh, your platform is this show that you do uh, where you've crossed over with Media Mar- Monarchy with James Evan Pilato. So how, do you, how did you meet him and start uh, New World Next Week? It was uh, shortly after I began my own podcast <clears throat> that he got in touch with me because I had played one of his one of the clips from his YouTube channel on my podcast, and he just got in touch to say, "Hey, you know, thanks for doing that. I've got a podcast of my own." He sent me the link, and unlike basically ninety nine point nine 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 percent of all the other people who send links to their podcast or whatever, this one was actually interesting and actually informative. At that time, he was doing two hours a week on a local radio station there in Portland, uh, basically going through news and information. And I found every single time there was there were all sorts of stories in there that I hadn't seen anywhere else or I hadn't heard about. So it was a great resource for me. And we so we started connecting that way. And then eventually, we uh, after a couple of interviews back and forth, we had the idea we should start a news program. And that was back in 2009. So it's now been almost 11 years that we've been doing that on pretty much a weekly basis. We spend, at the time, back in the day, because of YouTube restrictions, it was uh, 10 minutes. We had to keep it to 10 minutes. (laughs) Now that's almost unimaginable. Usually these days, it's more like 20 minutes a week of just trying to cover three important stories that we think uh, the, the audience needs to know about. And so nowadays, with how media is, are there any mainstream news sources that you have faith in? 
I don't have faith in any news source, really, and I think that's an important aspect of what I say and what what I try to preach to my audience. I don't want people to have faith in me. I want people to examine what I am saying and think critically about it and look at the sources of what I'm saying. That Until we reach that level of media criticality, I don't think we will have an informed public because I understand, I very much understand, how tempting it is to turn the brain off and to say, I trust this source, so if he's saying it, it must be true. Uh, but that, in that way, madness lies. Uh, because, I, I mean, at the very least, I can assure you, I am on the up and up. I am who I say I am. I'm doing this for the reasons I say I am. I'm doing my level best to inform people. But I am human. I make mistakes. And beyond that, I can only cover so much. I'm just one person. So obviously, you need to get information from a lot of different sources. And, and I also reject the idea of journalistic objectivity that some people uh, that has been drilled into the public, that journalists are floating on a cloud and they should both sides of an issue and blah, blah, blah. Well, actually, there's usually not two sides to an issue. issue. There's usually 27. And deciding which sides of the issue you want to give a voice and which you don't and what even counts as news versus what isn't news, what's worth covering, what isn't covering, all of those are editorial choices that are made by people coming from a certain perspective. So I don't try to hide the fact that I have a certain perspective, I have certain beliefs. And that absolutely colors the way that I present information and the type of information that I'm presenting. But having said that, I always, since the very beginning, an important core point of what I do is to provide links back to the source documents of what I'm talking about. If I talk about an article, I will link you the article. If I talk about a video, I will link you the video. If I make a statement about something, I will try to link you to that fact so that you don't have to take my word for it. You can go and bet it for yourself. And uh, basically what I'm doing is putting out a cookie crumb trail and saying, look, this is where the cookie crumb trail leads for me. Perhaps you will put that together to mix metaphors. Maybe you'll put that puzzle together in a different way and you'll see a different picture. That's fine. I have no problem with that. But I think the point is trying to construct reality from verifiable, documentable information, not from individual media sources. So no, there's no mainstream media source that I have faith in, but there's no media source of any kind that I have faith in. I love the way you answered that question. It, it, it's, it gets me ne to my next point here, which I was going to say with the Corbett Report and everything you do, what, it, it was the first place I had ever heard the term open source journalism, which I think should be pretty self-explanatory. Like you said, you're laying out all the links so that people can go fact check and read everything for themselves. And that's really important, I think. But in Canada, for some reason, we kind of live in this bubble where we think that our media isn't as heavily monopolized and bought out as the American media. We, oh, we look at the, you know, CNN and the Fox and we think, oh, that's bad. But for some reason, we think CBC, oh, they're good. They're, they're, they wouldn't lie to us. Why do you think we live in this kind of illusion? Right. This is one of the things that you notice when you do move away from home. You start to understand a little bit more about the way that uh, the, what differentiates Canadians from others. And part of that is the sort of built in knee jerk, reflexive, not anti Americanism per se, but at least, well, we're better than Americans. And, you know, anything that comes from there is madness and crazy, but anything that comes from Canada is good. And I, I, I was a victim of that mentality every bit as much as I think the average Canadian back when I was living in Canada. It's not until you get a sense of perspective on the world that you see how, how really knee-jerk that reaction is. And part of that, as you say, is the way that uh, Canadians tend to think, well, our media is so much better. And I suppose, I mean, if you're going to put CBC versus Fox or CNN or CNBC, yeah, I suppose there is a qualitative difference in terms of the way the information is presented and the thoughtfulness uh, that goes into that presentation, but that certainly does not mean there is no bias. In fact, if anything, it means the bias is that much more effective because it is presented in a, in a more uh, erudite and rational way that will hopefully appeal to people's cognitive senses and bypass some of the filters they would otherwise have on that information, which in my mind makes it more insidious. But yes, I think there is a large blind spot in the Canadian population towards the way they themselves are manipulated. They can see it very easily in other people, specifically in Americans. But uh, trying to get Canadians uh, convinced of that is, I won't say a lost cause, but certainly much more difficult than it should be um, for a population that, let's face it, there are a lot of intelligent and uh, insightful people in Canada, I know. But uh, unfortunately, a lot of them are 
trapped in that in that bubble of their thinking. And uh, I have certainly tried to prick that bubble with my needle of truth, <laughs> but one man can only do so much. And I definitely grew up in that bubble just the same as uh, many. I always thought Canada, you know, we're the good guys. We're fighting for the betterment of the world. We're always, you know, helping out and doing all these humanitarian things. But I didn't know that the last residential school was open until 1996. And all these ridiculous things happen in our government with, you know, selling asbestos to India and all these ridiculous things. I didn't learn all these things until I started to research things for myself. Uh, but, eugenical sterilization laws in my home of Alberta until the 1980s. Uh, yeah, it's uh, there's some pretty dark things that have happened in Canada that most Canadians have no idea about. And it seems, I guess what I'm trying to get at is um, there's a lot of differences between, we, we, we're we seeing each other as the enemy now, right? If you have a different opinion than me, then I can't even listen to anything you say because you're the enemy. And I think a lot of people feel this in their close relationships and their families, you know, their parents might not see a political uh, opinion the same way they do. And that just totally separates the whole family. How, what advice would you have for anyone in that situation? Just trying to like maintain relationships and not let all these crazy things happening in politics always just keep dividing us. Well, I think it is true. Uh, the extent to you are what you eat also applies in the information space, and you are the type of information that you are putting into your mind. Uh, you are responsible for what you hear, or whatever that uh, that phrase is. Uh, I think that is true to some extent, and it has been remarked that the online media space is one that tends to provoke extreme and polarizing reactions as a way to motivate people to essentially click. I mean, just clickbait. And but that that process has snowballed on itself to the point where now it's this unstoppable freight train of outrage. And that obviously motivates debate and argument, not not debate, just just argument for argument's sake as the main motivator of communication. And that is the, the type of model of communication that more and more people are being exposed to in the social media space, that we don't have rational discussions, we don't have debates between different point of, points of view, we, we just essentially shout at each other and call each other stupid. And that starts to escalate, as unfortunately we are seeing all over the world right now. Um, so uh, to a certain extent, I, I put the blame on the nature of the technology that is being used to send this information and the way that is being used, but obviously it does come down to ourselves and what we do with that. And it is getting harder and harder to find examples of people who are modeling intelligent conversation in a way that does not devolve into simple finger pointing and uh, in naming and shaming of people who are, think differently. Uh, and uh, again, I do put this in the on the media as a, a, an accusation that goes at least to the point of television dumbing down the public to the point where they we can't have arguments that go on for more than three minutes without inserting a commercial break. So it tends to uh, to devolve into just uh, talking points. Well, that has gone even further in the land of Twitter and 280 characters. So the, the idea of having intelligent, informed discussion is so far removed from reality. I would recommend for people to really get a grasp of what I'm saying, go, go watch – uh, and it's easily watchable on YouTube or archive.org or any of these places. Go watch uh, an example of even mainstream, even, you know, uh, mainstream American uh, primetime CBS type talk show from the 1950s or 1960s. Uh, I've watched um, uh, talks with people like Aldous Huxley or Ayn Rand or people like that at that time, 50, 60 years ago, having informed, intelligent, philosophical discussion where they're making cogent statements that take sometimes minutes to elaborate on a certain point, and they are free to do so because that was the nature of the format that they were being given at that time. And you can understand, I think palpably understand, that a society that grows up with that as the model of communication will not devolve into mindless name-calling and, and, uh, and, and trying to shut other people down for th thinking differently because what is being set as a bar of expectation is that we will talk and we will uh, have informed debates about what we're saying, not just arguments. Um, I don't know if there are models like that that we can turn to at this point, or at least not enough of them. I would even say things like at least the Joe Rogan podcast 
for anything else you could say about it, at least it has, uh, to some extent, reintroduced long-form discussion and sometimes entertaining views that we not nor, normally not entertain. That sort of thing, I would like to see that more broadly uh, modeled on, in the public. But uh, I, we are on that freight train right now of just outrage culture, and it's not an easy thing. I don't think any one of us can derail that, but we can, at the very least, try to to stop and and reflect on this freight train and where it's heading and what what we can do personally to at the very least be aware of it and hopefully try to avoid that type of argumentation online we we can set an example that can change this discourse although obviously not any one person can do it all by themselves how do you relax how do you take your mind off of the craziness and the chaos that's just constant? How do you take your mind yeah. off of that? Yeah, it is extremely important to do that because anyone who was 100% focused on the madness all the time would become mad themselves very quickly. Luckily, I have a family here, and luckily my wife is the least political person I have ever met, does not listen to my podcast, does not particularly care about the news, <laughs> which is extremely good for me. Because it means when I am not online and doing this, I can 100% detach from this. And that is extremely important for me. I like just going to the park and playing with my family and doing that kind of thing. Uh, that is my detachment. Um, I understand not everyone has that ability, but I certainly do recommend whatever it is you can do to detach from this. At some point every day, you should take time for yourself and to not be connected into this. Because as I say, there's no way to, uh, you, you, you can stare into the abyss for all, all you want, but it will start to stare into you and you have to detach yourself from it from time to time to remember who you are in and really to get a sense of why you're doing this. Uh, obviously, people who are familiar with my work will know I spend a lot of time talking about things that are enraging and maddening and other things. And if I don't, from time to time, take that moment to remember why it is that I am so concerned about the world and where it's heading. It's because I want to enjoy life with my family. That's ultimately what I want. I want the space and the type of world where I can just enjoy my time with my family. So we have to ground ourselves in what it is we are fighting for rather than just what we are fighting against. Well put. Is there anything else you'd like to say to our listeners? Uh, nothing that I think think we could encapsulate in just a minute or two here, but I would suggest if people are new to my work that they do go to CorbettReport.com just to see what I have there. There are thousands and thousands of hours audio, video, text, media up there, all completely for free, um, and I hope people will at least check it out. Uh, I understand a lot of people might have misgivings about this or that particular idea that I have, but that's, I think, part of the discussion. I have no problem with people disagreeing with me about this or that, but I just want to raise the caliber of the, the debate and the discussion that's going on in society so that people won't look at an idea that they're unfamiliar with or that they don't like and just immediately start name-calling people. Uh, that is the lowest form of communication, and I think we can do better than that. You've been listening to The Peach Pit. I've been here with James Corbett of The Corbett Report. Thank you so much, James, for taking time to talk to me. Thank you for having me on.